Hello, and welcome to the Citizens of Craft podcast, where we explore the objects we love, the reasons we love them, and the people who bring them to life. I'm your host, Megan Black. In my job as the director of the Canadian Crafts Federation, I have the absolute honor of meeting craftspeople from across Canada and beyond who dedicate their lives to the creation of artistic, skillful, and captivating objects Woodworkers, glass sculptors, jewelers and potters, textile artists, fashion designers, furniture makers, and more. You name it, there's someone out there making it and making it well. These are the citizens of craft. They are masters in their own right, chasing techniques that have been in use for thousands of years and exploring new technologies that have just begun to push the boundaries of art. They create objects with meaning, history, and purpose, rejecting the mass manufactured lifestyle of our time to capture something more authentic, something that fascinates, something that matters, something that tells the story of who we are. Join me as we explore that story through the 10 manifesto statements of the Citizens of Craft movement, from you are not a lemming, to cookie cutter doesn't cut it, and vases are people too. We'll discuss these ideas and so much more by talking with the people who bring them to life, the Citizens of Craft. All right, so hello and welcome to the 2018 finale of the Citizens of Craft podcast. As we head toward the end of the year, we are proud of the conversations that we've held so far, and we hope that you've enjoyed them as much as we have. We want to hear from you, so stay tuned to the end of this episode where we will give you information on how to share your thoughts with us. With your support, we can make sure that this conversation continues. Now, speaking of conversation, I am delighted to welcome our two finale guests. Both are mixed media artists in their own right who spend a significant amount of time on community development. And that, essentially, is the focus of today's episode, where we will address the Citizens of Craft manifesto statement, while we all march to different drums, we move together. Calling in from way up north in Sturgeon Falls, Ontario, we're welcoming Clayton Windat, a Métis non-binary multimedia visual artist, writer, and filmmaker. Clayton is also the executive director of the Aboriginal Curatorial Collective, an organization that advocates, activates, and engages with Canadian and international Indigenous curators, critics, and artists. Welcome, Clayton. Hi, thanks for having me. Calling in from yet another rural destination, this time in Sussex, New Brunswick, we are joined by Peter Pounding, a craft artist well-versed in ceramics, glass, metal, photography, and public art. Peter is a national treasure, winner of the coveted Governor General's Visual Arts Award, the Sadie Bronfman Award, which is the highest recognition for a craft artist in Canada. He was also recently involved in the development and launch of Axe, the art the Arts and Culture Center of Sussex. So welcome to you as well, Peter. Nice to be here. I am thrilled that we are able to bring you both together for this episode, because I know how hard you've both worked to benefit the craft community at large. Uh, You've had a big impact on the sector, both in your home regions and on the national community. And yet you're both based in very small rural communities on a regular basis. So why don't we start today's conversation with uh, a little description of where you are right now. So describe your immediate surroundings, where you're calling in from today, and then also your local community. How does the place that you work from affect what you do? So let's start with Clayton Wendat first. Um, so to today I'm calling in from home. I'm sitting at my kitchen table, uh, on Coburn road, which is just outside of garden village, which is, um, one of the main community, uh, areas for, um, Nipissing first nation, um, in the Nipissing district. Uh, technically my house is in Sturgeon falls, which is, um, uh, part of, uh, West Nipissing. Um, so I also work out of a office in North Bay and I just happen to be working ho- from home today, but, um, it really gives me critical distance being able to work on a national level, but not be immersed in a extremely active local art scene. So, I mean, there's lots of really good stuff that happens in Sturgeon Falls and North Bay. And, um, but I try not to become overly involved because that would be committing a high amount to the local where meanwhile I have to work across the country on an active basis. So 
if I was to, um, you know, commit hundreds of hours a month, uh, to things in this region, it'd be very hard to argue that I'm still able to have that critical distance and work across the entire country and at times outside of Canada as well. Mm -hmm. And that I can certainly understand based on my similar experience at the Canadian Crafts Federation being based in Fredericton, New Brunswick, wanting to be involved in the community, but also knowing how much time and effort it takes to, to really represent the country as a whole. And, and Peter Pounding, give us a description of where you are right now, the community that you live in, and how that affects what you do. Right. Well, I am sitting in the new um, Axe Ceramic Center uh, that is completely equipped and almost ready to go, but still smells like plaster dust. Um, and it's a 16 kilometer drive. It was a 16 kilometer drive in from my home and studio in Markhamville uh, through light snow. Um, this Sussex is a, a regional community center. It serves about 30,000 people that would consider Sussex their center, but within a hundred uh, kilometer radius, there are half a million people, which considering the the uh, population of New Brunswick is about 750,000 is pretty good. Where I live affects me deeply. Um, we, we moved to where we still live uh, almost 50 years ago now. <laughs> And our idea was that we were going to be self-sufficient. And we were pretty quickly disabused of that idea. And at, th at that point, we didn't really consider too much what community was going to mean. But it, it's become to mean almost everything, really. Um, the, the community itself, our, our little community, is very unusually tight. Um, we have a parade with 30 people in the parade and five people watching because the population is 37 people. <laughs> and, and I spend a lot of time outdoors in the woods and stuff. And I, I, my, my work in life is imbued with being outdoors, but also connected to different communities, local, regional, national, international. But my resting place, my center is uh, Markhamville. Wow. So you're both coming from small rural communities, but you're definitely reaching out beyond all of those things. And I think really everything that you do as, as artists and as community advocates and where you're doing it from really fits well into the manifesto statement for today's episode, which, as I said before, is, well, we all march to different drums. We move together. You value how each maker's unique expression bonds us as a richer community. So what were your initial thoughts when you first heard that manifesto statement? And, and how, does it uh, how does it resonate with you? Let's go to Clayton first. Well, um, you know, you, you, you hear um, a metaphor and you try to see um, like where the intent is within it. Uh, because if I, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that I automatically march to a drum, uh, but I definitely uh, dance to one, <laughs> or <laughs> sing to one, or um, make drums. <laughs> so there's um, there's lots there's lots there where I think the intent is more about um, the idea that we have these things that um, that make us different, and then we have these things that bring us together and. Um, for me, uh, I enjoy celebrating our differences in a way that, um, holds each other up as opposed to, uh, emphasizing, uh, difference as a way to try to, um, tear someone down. Um, although at times, um, you know, different cultural groups and different communities do feel the need to be defensive because they have a lot to defend or they have a lot to lose, or they, they feel that they need to defend themselves because they're under attack. So um, the beautiful part in craft and, and in arts in general is that when we start talking about the differences and the things that bring us together, um, we get to choose the messages that we want to push forward. At times, you know, reactive artwork that is um, a rallying point to make change is uh, addressing uh, something really negative, something terrible that's happening to people. And there's real value to that. And that might be emphasizing the difference as a way to bring people together by reconciling the, the problem or by trying to address it head on. Mm -hmm. 
And then other people approach it in a way where they steer away from emphasizing the negative and putting energy into that space, but instead trying to build from the other side to be, how do we prevent these issues in the first place? Or how do we bring people together to, to cause real good in the world? So, yeah, I, I think about it from both ends of the spectrum is that when you use a metaphor as general as, as the one you have, it, it kind of hopefully pulls out the best of both worlds. Mm-hmm. I hope so as well. And and Peter, what was your initial thought when you first heard that manifesto statement? Well, I, I think the thing that particularly resonated with me was the idea of enriching communities and being part of communities. I always think of myself as being part of, it's like overlapping circles of communities, uh, starting the, cent- the center's where we where we live and work and then working out f- from that and the incredible richness you get from interacting with and being part of these these various communities um, and the craft community to me has always been one that's been pretty welcoming and collegial and open um, and one of the and this may be a bit of an aside, but I was I was thinking about this last night when I was uh, after having spoken to somebody in government about funding this new business paradigm we, that we've got that everything's got to justify itself by some financial bottom line. People don't get it that the reason we are engaged with what we're doing is not primarily about uh, financial gain. It has to it has to engage with it, but we. I'd be a dentist if I was interested in making a lot of money. I'd still get to play with tools and, you know, shape things. But uh, anyway, I don't want to go too far down that one. But uh, it's just it's it's one of those uh, things that with I think that artists in general and craftspeople in general bring to a community a different point of view that isn't just about money. You know, we're we're really about enhancing community reflecting the community back to itself and um that's an important element of my life is kind of being part of the community especially as i've gotten older i've kind of recognized i've got more to give to the community for one thing but it's really on a selfish level very enriching I'm I'm very curious, and, and I'm sure that um, any of our listeners are curious as well to he- hear a few specific examples of this take on craft, on this this celebration of differences, or or emphasizing difference, or you know um, what those bonds are. Um, seeing some of that in action. So, how have you seen community development happen through craft, whether it's it's to heal or to grow or to break down barriers, um, whether it's language barriers or cultural barriers or socioeconomic barriers? There's so many barriers that we face in, in what is really an interconnected world. But how has craft and the community of craft broken through these barriers to help connect us? Uh, maybe you can give a couple of examples that you've seen in the community, either through your own experience or through through artworks that you've seen. Um, and maybe we'll start with Clayton Winnett on that one. So there's a there's an artist and a colleague named uh, Jacob Day Fox that I've been working with. And he does um, uh, indigenous uh, you know, beadwork. And I say indigenous beadwork because he's an indigenous person and he's working with beads. But, you know, indigenous beadwork is a really big open concept because he doesn't work automatically with uh, traditional imagery or traditional messages or, or like cultural spe- culturally specific messages. Although they become culturally specific through him uh, recontextualizing objects into uh, his own messages. So... Uh, I say all that recently he started a project where he was initiating um, like responses to nerd culture. And and I say that like, because we're both, he and I are both nerds and we play video games and, and, you know, read fantasy stuff and talk about, you know, you know, heavy metal bands and all the cliche things you can imagine that we would do. And now he's doing uh, beating projects that um, are responses to these kind of nerd, you know, clicks. And um, and there's this part of me that thinks about it in so many different ways about how it's following what 
he wants to do as part of himself because it's you know every every artist should be in some way reflecting their own voice in their work somehow and i mean it's arguable that anyone can actually avoid that um but then in addition to that like uh, avoiding the expected norms which i think is a large part of craft is that people get surprised when they pick up a you know a teapot that has a political message on the side of it people get surprised when they go to a, a powwow and they pick up a piece of beadwork and it, and it has a pop culture reference instead of um you know uh, a stereotypical meaning of some kind to the the person obviously i'm choosing really really carefully to not specifically identify any kind of traditional belief system so i don't want to make it that it's about not doing that specific belief it's more about breaking expectations and showing to people that a medium is can, can go so much further and then therefore can break down barriers between peoples by proving that uh, we're not all just stereotypes Absolutely. I absolutely agree with that. But I also see exactly what you're saying with, with that element of surprise of mixing these different interests because any interest or any different theme or topic can be incorporated into a craft object or a craft conversation. And there's so many artists who are doing that kind of surprising work today. Um, Peter Pounding, I'd, I'd like to get your opinion about um, that same topic of, of community development happening through craft. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think an interesting example in my own own life involved a uh, public art commission in Canmore, Alberta, where um, my idea was to include the community and aspects of of making the the sculpture, and it involved. Um, inviting people in the community to bring objects that had some meaning to them into me in a public place. And I took impressions of them in clay and then made stamps. And eventually that turned into a bronze uh, strata and a tall kind of uh, pyramid shape. And it was a really rich experience because it, it did a couple things. It, it got the community personally involved in the process. So I met the community that I was making the work in, and I learned about a lot of people. And it worked the other way, too. It got them invested in the notion of a, uh, a public uh, piece that typically kind of just lands places. Public art often just shows up, and nobody really has any clue what it is or where it came for, from or why. And in this case, I had... Uh, people from all different kinds of walks of life and different backgrounds from indigenous to immigrants. And I had somebody bring in a gold Olympic medal so that I could, so that I could turn it into bronze. But, um, it, it showed me something that you don't get working alone in a studio is the the value of, um, going out in, into the community and engaging them in something. And, and the public art process makes that possible. I, 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 you know, I think making individual objects, it's a, it's a different kind of thing. Although I think one of the things that uh, we do working with our hands is we are building on this. There's a continuity of our continuing to do something that is so human, which is using our hands to, to make useful things. And I don't necessarily mean functional, but I mean culturally useful things. Um, and particularly in a time when so much of everything that's happening is moving off in other directions uh, that we couldn't have imagined 10 years ago, let alone 100 years ago. So we, I think we have, make a connection that way. Uh, between each other because we have this similar uh, obs similar obsessions, but with the public because I think there is a, a a deep recognition of something human about the handmade. Mm -hmm. And talk about a willingness to um, have a shift in value towards an object 
and a connection with a public event, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you mentioned um, someone bringing a gold medal and being willing to have that, an oppression taken of that, and then essentially having it transformed into bronze. I feel like that's a pretty rare case where someone would sort of trade a gold medal for a bronze medal, <laughs> viewing a different kind of value in that experience. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it wasn't quite that literal, but I did make the comment. And I said, are you sure you want your gold medal turned into bronze? And she laughed. <laughs> <laughs> so I just want to mention a, a quote from a speaker that we had at the most recent Canadian Crafts Federation conference. Uh, our guest keynote speaker was the Honorable Senator Patricia Bovey, and she said something during that talk that I think resonates with this conversation. And I'd like to get your opinion on both of from both of you on this. Uh, her quote was, you as creators must not be afraid to tell the troublesome, the wonderful and the difficult challenges, as well as the achievements we have made as a nation. Our languages, including the visual arts, are our soul, and perhaps the best way to convey truth, reality, the present, and the future. And I think that really speaks to some of the things we've been talking about already. Um, Clayton, do you have any thoughts on, on that? I really do believe that, um, that Canada as a country... Um, because of the way things are set up and there is uh, so much public discourse in regards to uh, different issues um, that they, that this country has the ability to shift its image towards the celebration of that discourse. So as opposed to um, emphasizing uh, again, the, the things that um, that drive up, us apart, uh, that the country itself could be very proud of the fact that that um, when there is something that um, people maybe feel is unjust or that is causing harm, that instead of silencing those voices, that those voices can come forward and be heard and that the issues can be addressed. I know that in many instances, issues uh, aren't addressed or that they haven't been addressed. And, and there's very many people currently, you know, fighting to have, um, different, different forms of inequalities, uh, you know, rectified, but, mm -hmm. and, uh, I know that these things take time and sometimes people don't want to hear that. Um, but, uh, I'm also just aware of globally, uh, areas of the world that, um, voicing your opinion and when it falls outside of the, um, the rulers of, of the time that, 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 that a voice in that opinion can cause you to be, um, removed or, uh, harm caused to you. And, um, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, I live in a country I do because I, I get to, uh, try to push for, to make this place a better place and that I'm not, uh, you know, killed for doing it. So, there's, there's so much in that statement that the senator has made that uh, could be explored. Uh, I do think that uh, the art scene in general, especially craft, has the responsibility to um, try to address issues that are really big issues. You've got a large audience and a large group of people committed to craft as a cause. Um, these are the issues we all need to be addressing. It, it's not always going to be uh, beautiful, although really ugly messages can often make really beautiful art. Absolutely. And I think art is a way for people to tap into some of those really difficult truths or those complicated conversations. People aren't always great at having those one-on-one, -on -one, but if you have a filter like the arts, it's a way for people to approach those conversations. To shock them into having those conversations, I think is an important thing for us to consider as a way to communicate with each other in a friendly way, even if it's difficult. Peter, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think that, you know, the objects we make can be openings for uh, allowing conversations to happen that might not happen otherwise. But beyond that, one of the things that's been really important in my life is the, the fact that I'm independent, independently employed. I don't have to answer to anyone um, from an employment point of view. So it, it has freed me to be able to 
um, engage with people and the community in a in a way that I might have been fearful to do otherwise, um, particularly in rural areas where stand you know being the nail that stands up is can be difficult. So um, I think that that's something that that people in the arts in general are more freed to do partly because of the nature of people who tend to engage with the arts because uh, so much of it's about expression. And I think that because of our relative independence of mind and to some extent independence from employers, um, that we're, we're freer to speak up and speak speak truth to power and raise issues and we tend it seems, it seems like we're frequently ahead of the curve in terms of seeing what the problems are and calling them out so let's shift a little bit well we're already getting pretty personal we're getting into a conversation that is very much about the personal and the meaningful but for you in your own life as a, an artist or as a community organizer when you have these issues that you want to address and the and you know, the, the freedom to do so, it's important to be able to turn to a community that is willing to hear that or willing to join you in that kind of conversation. Where have you turned, whether it's a, a provincial or territorial craft council or a guild or an artist run center, what kind of communities have you turned to and why is it important for you to have a community of makers that you can connect with in your own life? And uh, Peter Pounding, what do you think about that? Okay, uh, there are a couple things there. Uh, first of all, um, in terms of what I was just speaking about and, and being, um, you know, kind of a, an activist. I, I'm an activist, let's face it, environmentally particularly, but also in the arts. Um, environmentally, that's a, that, that's that, that's an, one of my overlapping communities. It isn't. I, it isn't that I go to the the New Brunswick, the craft MB meetings to talk about those, although that that may happen uh, behind the scenes. Um, but for me, the the community of makers is that kind of almost like an emotional support group. It's people that I can go to that I feel totally comfortable with, and understand that they understand. Um, the conditions of living that life. And that can be kind of the, the place you can go to to recharge and get centered. Um, I think that's, that's one of the strong values of communities of, of artists and being, in, being able to be in touch with them. And Clayton, you actually worked in an artist-run center. That was one of the first places that you that you started your professional field within. What are the kind of communities that you feel that you've been able to lean on perhaps throughout the development of your career? I mean, I definitely agree with Peter about the idea of having like uh, like a dedicated place or group of people to sort of um, call your 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 sort of safe safe haven and the place where you know you can go to to make work or to just be with people making and and then therefore um, sort of recharge. Uh, I feel like that's that's a very important thing that we all have to have. And some people are very lucky and they they live in that space and and make from that place on a daily basis. And um, I hope to one day be in that that situation myself. Um, I started in the arts as a designer. Uh, and then went back to school because um, I wasn't really enjoying being a designer. I wanted to pursue my own arts practice where I'm the only one that I have to be, that has to be happy with the end product. So um, I went back to school and then I ended up getting somehow falling into the not-for-profit realm and artist-run culture and worked at, worked with the Whitewater Gallery for just over seven years. and. And uh, that was a, a beautiful uh, struggle, um, which uh, I think a lot of artist-run centers would say is that uh, no matter how much money they have or no matter how how well off they are, there is there is this sort of beautiful struggle and, and the uh, romantic notion of uh, the starving artist is there somehow. But I think that artist-run culture in general in Canada has been 
um, like a major part of what pushes me forward. It's also where I see a lot of um, message making being formed. I still think that they're a great resource for people to to draw upon. Absolutely. And I think we're, we're kind of touching on the idea of these communities. You know, Peter mentioned it being like a personal, almost refueling. I don't think that was the word you used, but the idea that it's a, a place to touch in and to connect with like-minded people or people who are un- going to understand the same struggles, that beautiful struggle that everyone is going through in the arts realm or specifically from an arts organization point of view. Um craft specifically i find can it can certainly be a team activity in a lot of ways or or a team effort but it also can be a really lonely road um you know whether you're working in an independent studio or, or from your home or in a solo studio space or once you've left school and you've kind of found yourself out in in the world on your own you know that how can we combat that very real isolation that artists can feel or that anyone at all whether you're an artist or not um can feel in this modern day and age are these places um somewhere that someone can go and is that community connection a resource for them we'll go with peter first coming back to acts the the arts uh, center that we've just got going here one of the things that's really impressed me is their it's the first thing of its kind in this region ever and um it's it's almost that one of those build it and they will come things people are just coming out of the woodwork all over the place uh (laughs) that i didn't even know were in the community so that that's fascinating having provided a, a kind of a it's a venue there's a restaurant there's beer on tap it's people uh it's not just about the beer (laughs) (laughs) Uh, and so it's you know it it is um an important element in the community and you know the interesting things is that there are people from all different walks of life and all different backgrounds and all different occupations who show up here but it is centered around an appreciation for the arts um as a kind of a starting point. So you're finding um, levels of connection that you probably didn't, we, I didn't realize I had with people before, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it, living in a small community, you think, you know, everybody who was of interest, but I didn't by a long shot. If you had one, one thing, one specific message that you believe could help people who are, who are either feeling isolated or who are seeing that elitism and not sharing how or where they fit in, who are feeling disconnected, again, whether they're an artist or, or not, what message do you trumpet out to the world to try to help people understand that value of the arts and and the impact they can have on all of our lives, whether maker or not. So like no big deal, right? That's not a big question at all. But um, if I could just ask you, like, what what is the thing that you tend to try to lean towards or that you tend to try to lean into when you're connecting with people about your work or about craft in general? Um, maybe I'll go to Clayton, Clayton Windap for that first. Well, um, that's a good question. Uh, I think about uh, really when when someone, especially if someone's showing interest, because I mean, uh, you know, like pass, passive uh, viewing or someone goes, oh, I really like your work. And I'm like, oh, good. And then I don't ask anything else because, uh, I mean, unless they're really asking questions or going further, I, I don't want to have the, the level of, of discourse that'll take place. Because for me, reconciling context is a big a big thing. It can take a long time and Mm -hmm. you're putting in real effort with someone when that takes place. Um, especially when, you know, you, they might say, well, why are you taking this stance in this way? And then I'm like, well, how much time do you got? And you're about to find out like who I am as a person (laughs) in great detail and all the things that led to these moments and why I stand in this exact way on this exact issue. And then where this work will go from here. So, um, uh, as an example, uh, I've talked about this a little bit lately about how uh, I've always been a fan of um, old school provocateur behavior, like the idea of you really, you know, being punchy with work and at times extremely punchy, like to the point where it's almost shock. But 
for me, the, the point was to draw attention to an issue and then the person that's doing it follows through to actually address the issue. So it's not just a subject to them. It's part of their life. Like they're, they're one of the leaders within a cause pushing to change something or to make that world a better place. I think about, for instance, uh, Christy Belcourt and their, um, you know, like w- water rights discussions that uh, they've been doing, like uh, that, you know, Isaac Murdoch and Christy Belcourt and everyone at their, that they've been working with um, has been pushing for water rights advocacy very heavily through their practice. But we're not talking about doing a one-off exhibition. We're talking about over the span of, you know, I guess, <laughs> I don't want to be quoted on this, but like, all, you know, possibly close to a decade at this point that this has been happening. Mm-hmm. And at that point, you start to realize this isn't just a hot button issue for them to make successful art with. This is about them actually attempting to change the world with their art. And they're pushing for that. And it means something. And um, so when, when someone engages with me at that level and starts to really find out, it, it starts to almost bring them into that conversation and how they become part of it. And, and it's almost hard for them to avoid it because by exploring my arts practice, you're inevitably exploring who I am. Mm -hmm. And Peter, what are your thoughts on that? I I think I'm coming to this from a slightly different point of view because um, while some of what I do is intended to be thought provoking and sometimes on specific subjects, I took your question to mean uh, somebody that's coming to me that is feeling either isolated or wants to has creative impulse or uh, impulses or obsessions and they they don't know what to do with them mm-hmm. and and uh, so rather than, than in reaction to my work and what I think and what I say I'm thinking about uh, the role I've played a lot as as kind of a mentor or a guide or just somebody that turn somebody in the right di- in, in a direction so and I have these conversations all the time um, and I generally speaking I think people they need to talk to people uh, and get involved in their community that's that's huge I think that that kind of isolation that that people tend to feel whether they're in the arts or not is most most easily uh, put in perspective by actually doing stuff for other people by getting involved in a community center or something um, on that level that gets you connected with other people and asking for help, looking for a mentor. Um, I know when I was young and starting out, there were no formal programs or anything that I was aware of, but I benefited hugely from the kindness and uh, willingness of um, older people in craft and in the arts to share, give technical advice, to commiserate, to be just an example that it was possible to do what I wanted to do and and see it happening in reality. So I think um, from, you know, from the point of view of somebody who's needs the connection is seek it. And from the point of view of somebody who is connected, like uh, Clayton and I are, is share it. I think I think that's great. Yeah, I agree. I, I often talk about if you're going to make, you should make with meaning and make with purpose and then make it your life. I think that we've had a super interesting conversation already throughout all of this. And I think that um, we're going to lighten things up a little bit. It was, we head to the end of this episode. Um, so you may have heard in one of our previous podcasts that we, we tend to go with a segment called the slow craft lightning round. Um, it doesn't typically go very fast for a lightning round, but uh, here's how it works. So I'm going to ask you each a series of questions um, and you will share your immediate thoughts as fast as you can. So we're going to start with Peter first, and then we'll go on to Clayton. Um, And if you can just follow up immediately after, then we will go ahead with these questions. So are you ready? Ready as I'll ever be. Yeah. (laughs) So, all right. One, two, three. Let's do this. What is your favorite gallery? Axe Gallery. (laughs) 
<laughs> Axe gallery, sure. What was the last craft piece that you purchased for your personal collection? I always tried to trade. <laughs> uh, I commissioned a, a handmade pocket knife that is less than one inch in length from a man named Stephen Crump. Lovely. Where did you study? Everywhere. <laughs> the the school of kick ass and hard knocks. <laughs> If you weren't an artist, what would you be? And Peter already suggested he might be a dentist. Is that true, Peter? No, no, no. So, Peter, what would you be? You know, I don't think there's anything else I could be. Then I don't think I'm suited for anything else. <laughs> <laughs> and Clayton? Uh, uh, a cab driver during the day and a, a vigilante superhero during the evening. <laughs> You're not already? <laughs> N- not yet. So what is your greatest weakness and your greatest strength, Peter? Overconfidence. And your greatest strength? Overconfidence. <laughs> because it, it leads me to try things that uh, if I considered them more thoroughly, I wouldn't. And sometimes it works out. But it can also lead me to do things. Overconfidence can also lead me to um, injuries. <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Clayton? Greatest weakness or greatest strength? Uh, I would just agree with Peter and say the same thing, but I'm going to try to come up with something else. I think I talk too much at times. and I was going to say that too. <laughs> uh, and, and, and I think that that's a, like, it, it's a massive weakness because it gives away way too much uh, to people. And then I think a strength... Um, uh, I think I think that you know we're almost going full circle. Like I think that a large strength is seeing uh, things from a distance, the way that the way that I have, and how that valuing and understanding that distance allows me to make things intersect that maybe people wouldn't normally think to make them intersect. One more question for you: What do you wish more people understood about craft? And we'll go with Clayton first. I guess I guess I really would like to try to raise awareness of uh, of of the need for connections between the various maker communities and craft and and how that um, merging of groups or bringing merging of minds or connecting of people isn't a threat on anyone who is trying to reinforce a genre or or really be strong in a specific area. So like someone who is a potter and they are absolutely adamant about being a potter and they say, sure, it's part of craft, but then they'll say what isn't part of craft and they're really, they have set ways. And I'm like, it's fine to say you are part of something or this is part of something and be pro something, but I really like to try to remove some of the attack on what isn't and um, and allow, craft beco- to become more about the the fluid movement of using um, potentially functional or uh, celebratory items that, um, that that can transfer messages to really large audiences and be that accessible. I, I'd really like to see that happen more. Wow. And Peter, what do you wish more people understood about craft? The, the notion of fidelity to a technique or to a material or to a discipline. Um, I've kind of made a career of breaking whatever rules there were around it. I'm, I've, I've been a complete, I have had no fidelity at all to material um, and kind of followed my curiosity. Now, I know everybody's not built that way. And I, and, and it means that I have worked with a huge number of materials and I can, uh, and I'm not a master of any of them, <laughs> but I've, I've learned to do what I need to do with them to get where I want. And along the way, there are, you know, were many tears and things that didn't work out. So um, I'm suspicious of uh, fidelity outside of marriage. All right. So there you have it. That is the final lightning round for our 2018 podcast so um i hope you felt that was enlightening and thank you so much for for playing along so i i really do want to thank you both again for for taking the time to be here with us today and for all the work that you both do for the arts in canada 
um, without people such as yourselves and um, and all the guests that we've had on the podcast so far, the world would truly be a little less vibrant, a little less connected, and a little less entertaining, I'd say. So thank you so much. Um, I, I just need to end today by giving our listeners a chance to hear about what you have coming up on the horizon. Um, I know <laughs> neither of you are very good at slowing down. So tell me, what have you got planned for your next project or your next challenge? Or what would you like to see happen next? And we'll start with Peter. I'll, I'll start with Axe. Um, we've got the Ceramic Center is up and almost ready to run, and we're hoping to get the Transition Studio program going, which will be a venue for um, people who have had their formal training in ceramics and either have gone off on their own or have just finished school and would like to have a period of time where they have a completely equipped studio with mentors to start their professional practice in um, in a welcoming kind of community atmosphere with mentors to develop the things you need to develop and get help in places that you maybe are lacking uh, skill in, like making a business plan and all that wonderful stuff. So that's that's a big part of what I'm focusing on now. And the other thing is I have a uh, retrospective exhibition at the Beaverbrook Art Gallery in 2020 with an accompanying book. And that will be a preoccupation over the next couple of years. So uh, Clayton, what, uh, what do you have on your docket next? Um, so outside of all of the wonderful arts administrative led actions, uh, um, my personal practice, uh, I'm developing a uh, collective, um, which is a curatorial exhibition and an installation based installation. So I'll be curating and and art, and the artist um, with a group of people where we are. Um, I've been making. Um, toys and action figures for a long time and now I'm modifying those to create a role-playing game environment where uh, the installation in the exhibition space would be this large-scale created um, almost like a video game level but uh, but a Dungeons and Dragons style game tabletop game that would circle the exhibition space around the outer walls and, and convey like this sort of dungeon-like environment and then uh, figures and, and creatures and things that would all go within it. And then um, as a collective, we would play this game. That sounds fascinating. And I definitely want in on that game. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you both so much. I think this has been a really interesting conversation and I really appreciate both of you taking the time to uh, come together and share your thoughts. Today's episode of the Citizens of Craft podcast has been made possible through funding from the Canada Council for the Arts and with the support of the many members of the Canadian Crafts Federation. Thank you to the artists who shared their thoughts and their time with us today. And thanks to all of you out there who took the time to listen. Continue the conversation online and see work from today's guests on the Canadian Crafts Federation, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram accounts. While you're out there on the web, be sure to visit citizensofcraft.ca. There you'll see the profiles of over 600 professional craft artists. You can search by artist, medium, and location, even your own postal code, to connect with artists where they live and work across the country. Are you a maker? A lover of all things craft? Want to make a local connection? Look up your provincial or territorial craft council today. And join us next time on the Citizens of Craft podcast. Until then, craft on. Craft on.